Okay, so we're stopping for lunch right now. And uh, the Pinelands National Reserve is the only such reserve in the United States. There is no other pine, another national reserve. And essentially, so if you can see from this map, <clears throat> Cape May, Atlantic City, Philadelphia, 1.1 million acres. Um, the largest wilderness on the East Coast between DC and Boston. And it's about 20% of the state of New Jersey. And the hero of the story is former Governor Brendan Byrne, who made it his mission to do something about the Pine Barrens and preserve this area. Now, his inspiration was an author named John McPhee. Have you read Pine Barrens? Yes. So, if you've read The Pine Barrens uh, by John McPhee, mm -hmm. 1968, he had just graduated college in 65. And so, he, he was um, working on, he had published two books, working on research, and probably what drew him down here more than what you think it is because they value there's a major stop on the atlantic flyway for birds they cleverly bought up some acreage around it to stop the uh, land developers and they fought it until 1964 and they win it was the first property included under the wilderness act signed into law in 64 by uh, president johnson the one on the turnpike 49 square miles of concrete and asphalt in the city of 250,000 people. Plot it right there. This is a spell at the beginning of the end of the pine barrens. Local people band together, they fight, and they protest. But what really stops it is geology. And uh, the Appalachian Trail here, and rocks and fossils from every age. The dark, the green is the intercoastal plain where the good soil came from. So that dark soil, that fertile soil I showed you on the bus. The yellow is the sand, the outer coastal plain. Here's Philly, here's Atlantic City. So most of the Pine Barrens is in the uh, outer coastal plain. So imagine I'm gonna slice New Jersey this way and we're gonna do a cross section and look inside. So from your perspective on your left, so over here, we'll put Philadelphia, where the star is. So there's Philly. And then we have the Delaware River. Then the land rises. So there's the intercoastal plain where the good soil came from. Then the land falls away, outer coastal plain, Atlantic Ocean. And where the star is, is Atlantic City. Now, thinking of plate tectonics, the North American plate runs at a 10 degree angle down here. And so this, you have to imagine as solid bedrock. So solid rock. And to give you perspective, if you were to stand on the beach in Atlantic City, if you could, you'd have to go through one mile of sand to get the bedrock. So that's how much sand is on the outer coastal plain. Now, it's not just the white sugar sand. There's layers of green sand that stratify the sand. And the green sand really is green. Now, when it's wet, it's like a heavy clay. When it's dry, you can take a pinch if you like. You can crush it up and it's a sand. It's green sand. Very fine. And this was used as fertilizer for about 100 years. Oh, 1830s to the 1930s. And New Jersey has more green sand than any place in the world. Oh. 
Now this was used, as I said, as a fertilizer, and it's easy for me to obtain this because it comes to the surface right here in my town, and my town is named after it. This is Haddonfield over here. And the other colloquial name for it is Marl. I live in Marlton. And so anywhere in Marlton, you can pretty much put a shovel in the ground and you hit Marl. And so it was being sold, dried up and sold in Philly at Sears and Roebuck and shipped out as a fertilizer. Well, this stratifies and when it's wet, it is like a heavy, heavy clay. Water doesn't easily go through clay. So, when you teach sixth grade, you got models. So <laughs> I didn't bring the whole jar. Imagine a jar of marbles to represent this top layer of sand and heavy clay represents the bottom part of the jar. So when it rains out here, the water easily sinks, soaks down through the sand and is in the layer of sand, fills up the gaps in between the sand and clings to each grain of sand. So imagine a couple hundred feet of that. That's what's in the ground. Between these two layers, 17 trillion gallons of water. This was the number determined by the U.S. Geologic Survey in 1966. Enough to cover the state of New Jersey six feet deep with pure water. Pure and clean. So the Kirkwood and the Cohansey aquifers make up the, the lifeblood. So there's the, there's the top of the Kirkwood Cohansey aquifer. Wherever you see a lake, river, stream, that's the top of the aquifer. And that's what stopped the jet tour, realizing that there was this huge quantity of water underneath the state. And if we built on it, duh, we would pollute it and lose it. And anyone that lives in the pines, when their house is built, a pipe is shoved down in the ground, and that's all a well is. You just take the water directly out of the ground. Now, if you live here, though, and you have a well, the water is incredibly clean, uh, that big chunk. So, Miss Diane, what other color do you see in that besides the green? Rust. The rust, the orange. That's iron. where the iron comes from. So that oh, bog was iron we spoke of on the bus, it's in the sky. Water. The acidic water perks down, takes the iron out, when it hits a lake, river, stream, and hits oxygen <coughs> with the help of bacteria, it forms bog iron. And if you have a well, <laughs> well, that iron's in your water, and so you have to have a water conditioner, otherwise you have hard water, and your sinks turn orange. And so this is, um, like I said, very close to the surface here. And then there are other aquifers. This is the Mount Laurel, and then this is old, old water called the uh, PRM. The other place I pointed to in Haddonfield, Haddonfield had marl pits too. Theirs were more special because in the 1850s, 1858, a local paleontologist was spending the summer there. And long story short, he gets credit for discovering the first complete skeleton of a North American dinosaur, Hadrosaurus. And if you go to Haddon Field, you'll see a sculpture of Hattie on um, Kings Highway. So there's a sculpture of Hattie. Um, if you ever run a game show. This is Franklin Parker Preserve. So Franklin Parker was one of the Penner's Commission Yeah. 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 He was a great environmentalist. Yeah, we're gonna go. We're gonna yeah, we do know. Let's go, girls. Big hawk. Yeah. And it's past.
past season, but there's an insect out here called an ant lion that builds a pitfall trap in the sand and captures insects and eats them. But what I, the reason I stopped is because of this black stuff. This is actually a type of lichen. This is called tar lichen because it looks like tar. And it's probably the only thing that can live in sugar sand. And so it truly is a pioneer species. One of the first things in, it stabilizes the sugar sand. And then you start to get other lichens and grasses and heathers and things that start to work their way in. I built that three weeks ago. <laughs> so there we go so the little black part thank you got lots of seeds and they fly away from ma and pa plant they land in the ash more more pine trees so fire know that. favors the pine not the oak and it's a very fire so over here is boxwood Okay, well, we're headed back to the van. We had a really nice time out here. This is a wonderful place. The Patona Trail is just really awesome. Okay, here we go. Another mushroom. Are we there yet? <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're at the end of the road here. We're going to wait for our van to pick us up. Before we're going to like this set. Oh my goodness. You'll feel the throbbing of the muscles. <laughs> The Tony Trail map. <laughs> hey, hey, Yaman! Hey, hey. 